Valerie, what? Oh, you wrote a new one? Oh, oh, I just saw this one too. Oh, um, okay, so Valerie has written another one for me, and uh, I guess we're looking at imaginary poles and stability. So we'll do that. Um, okay, so we have the transfer function again. What we'd like to do is factor it, like we did last time when we had the real poles. But we see when we try to factor this, mm, this does not factor very nicely. So we can't use our traditional method of just factoring and just picking the values easily. We have to do something a little bit slightly more complicated, but still very easy. So, well first let's do the easier part. Let's find the zeros for this system. So our zero here would be negative one, because that s of negative one makes this numerator is zero. So now let's try to find the poles. All right, so it, we can't factor this directly, so we have to use the quadratic formula. So for that, we have to find s equal to the opposite of b, so negative two plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four a, which is one, and c, which is two, all of that over two times a. So there's our setup, and now we just need to solve for this. So we see that if we, well, do one thing at a time, negative two plus or minus something all over two. So now we have to uh, solve inside the radical. So we have to do four minus eight, so that's a negative four. And if we solve this out, we'll see that we get a negative one plus or minus, we'll have, we have a negative uh, under the radical, so we bring out j, and then we just have two over two, so we get one. So these would be our poles, and here is our zero. So first, let's bring it over to our nicely drawn uh, real and imaginary axis for the pole zero diagram, and we see that the zero is at negative one, so we put a little zero here. And then we have our zeros, sorry, our poles at negative one plus or minus j. So we have one here and here. And often these will come in pairs, so they'll be often mirrored across the real axis. And that's what the case here. So we have two uh, poles and they are in, well, this side we call the left half plane and the right half plane would be this side, so the right side of the imaginary axis. And we see that our two poles are in the left half plane and we know that they will then be stable. So now I'm gonna show you a little bit of why this system will be stable. All right, so we know our poles and zeros and let's try to think back to what this means in the time domain. So we look at this, hmm, we can't factor the denominator so we can't break it apart like we did last time. So we have to actually think about this in terms of cosine and sines. So if we look up in a table, we will see that if we know a transfer function that looks like this, so s plus alpha and then s plus alpha in the denominator squared plus an omega here, we can take the inverse Laplace of this, and we will get an expression e negative alpha t times cosine oops, of omega t times u of t, where this is our unit step. If, again, we assume that we have zero initial conditions such that we start at zero, so we can kind of just ignore this unit step notation, then we would get e to the negative alpha t cosine of omega t. And this is essentially a decaying exponential with some oscillation multiplied by it. And this will be a stable system. So if we can map this to look like that, take the inverse transfer function, sorry, inverse Laplace, and make it look like this, then we can analyze it. So let's try to put this in that form. Okay, well, let's uh, first just try to equate them and see what happens. So 
if we take this, s squared plus 2s plus 2, and we want to make it look like this, so let's just start with s plus alpha. And we'll take this and we'll actually multiply this out. So we'll do s squared plus 2 alpha s plus and square the alpha, alpha squared plus omega squared. We will see that we get some equating values here. So from the top, we can see that alpha should be equal to a, sorry, to 1. Alpha should be equal to 1. And then these match up very nicely. So alpha 1 here matches here. So now we just need 2 to equal alpha squared plus omega squared. We already know that alpha squared is 1, so we get 2 equals 1 plus omega squared. So if we let omega be equal to 1, then this is satisfied. So we have these two values, and now we can transform our transfer function into the time domain. So if we take down here, take the inverse Laplace, and we assume zero initial conditions, then we can write this as this expression. So f of t will be equal to e to the negative alpha, which is 1, so just negative t, times cosine of omega, which is 1, so just t. And if we look at what this looks like on a graph in the time domain, then we will get, so it starts out about 1, and it will, the exponential part will decay, right, towards 0. And actually, we need to kind of mirror this on the negative part, too. What our actual function will look like is that exponent times the cosine. So it'll start up here, and it'll oscillate back and forth. But as time goes to infinity, our system will also go to, well, it will go to 0. So as t goes to infinity, our system goes to 0. And we know that that is stable. Hooray! So from this example, we can see that we had poles in the left half plane. They're imaginary. But we were able to transform it into an exponential times a cosine, so some oscillate, oscillatory component. I'll caveat this with the fact that I chose a very nice system to put us directly into this form. but. If you have any system with imaginary poles, you can put it into this form or a combination of cosine and sines, and then you can do the same process and go into an exponential decay times some sort of oscillating function. So short story is if you can find the poles and they are all in the left half plane, then you can say that the system is stable. And we'll be using that in uh, the future to analyze our system. So hope that helped. So we're back for a clarification. And after some questions from students that I had today, I realized that there was some confusion point. And it's because I misspoke a little bit. And I want to just clarify what we're talking about here. So the thing I'm talking about here is when I said zero initial conditions, I don't actually mean zero initial conditions for the function because Clearly, I've drawn this with not zero initial conditions. What I actually mean to say is that, I'm going to erase this stuff. What I actually mean to say is that we have zero initial conditions as we approach zero from the negative side. So zero, condition, zero initial conditions from, I guess, from negative. And what this really means is that we're looking at how the system reacts to a step function. So if this is the time domain, uh, we're really looking at u of t. And u of t is just a step function here. We're essentially hitting the system with a step, so we're changing it. But before, as we approach time equals 0, from the negative side, we're 0. And that's what I meant to say when I said 0 initial conditions, from the negative side approaching 0. So I just wanted to clarify that what we're really doing here is just seeing how the system reacts when a step function hits a system. So 
I hope that clears up the confusion. Uh, it's just so that when we take the Laplace transform, we don't get our extra, we can kind of make this equal to one and get rid of our, um, our any conditions that rely on the negative side going to zero. So I hope that's clearer. Um, the process is still the same. I just wanted to make sure you understand why that happens.